Call the meeting to order at uh, 18.03, Tuesday, July 2nd. Approval of minutes from previous meeting. I motion we approve the minutes. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Minutes approved. Unanimous. All business. FY 2024 Chiefs report. Okay. Bring that up for you. Uh, you have this. Um, in front of you. Um, so basically, fourth quarter, we saw a 9% increase in calls, um, so up to 411, which gives us to fiscal year 24, a total call volume of 1,498 calls. I was hoping for just two more, just to round it out, but here we are. Um, our mutual aid response um, was 18% of our total volume. Um, which is more or less consistent with previous years. Um, as you all know, my great hope is to increase that number of mutual aid response um, over a period of time um, while maintaining coverage to our primary service area, of course, um, because it's hugely beneficial. Uh, by community, um, as expected, um, Within our primary service area, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley, the numbers are predictable and consistent as we've seen in previous years. I included Conway in our primary service area, even though they're not. Um, we did a, a fair amount of responses to Conway, um, just 57 um, in the fiscal year. Um, that's another discussion for another day, um, but uh, just on behalf of the entire South County team, we're always happy to go to Conway. Um, we like to be good neighbors. Um, Greenfield uh, shot up a little bit in the fourth quarter, uh, which we're super happy about. And then other mutual aid really did uh, kind of remain flat uh, throughout the fourth quarter. So by year end, this is what we looked like. Um, and these are good numbers. Um, as far as response by disposition, uh, the vast majority of our calls, um, 1,176 of them were treat and transport. And this includes a number of categories that is both intercepts, primary mutual aid, uh, primary response within our own service area being the bulk of it, we had a small number of refusals over the uh, fiscal year, um, a very even smaller amount of cancellations and dead on arrivals, even, for the most part non-existent. There were a few. So real uh, fourth quarter updates. Um, you're all sick of hearing it by now, but um, the Lions Club uh, gave us this donation of new first in bags. If you haven't seen them, um, please check them out before you leave uh, at the end of the evening because they are beautiful. Um, we're thrilled uh, to get these. They deeply impact the way that we provide care um, by allowing for what's known as a pit crew um, response. Uh, it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, we've added a couple of clinical um, things to uh, the basket here. So we've added surgical cricothyronotomy um, as a, a procedure for the paramedics on staff. Uh, so that's great. We had a really nice training where our medical director, Dr. Matt Shapiro, came down. We got a donation from uh, a farm in Athol um, with some pig tracheas and we did all that. And that equipment is in the ambulances and is ready to go. We've transitioned our CPAP towards a bi-level CPAP or BiPAP, um, which is a slightly more expensive equipment, not much more expensive, but the, uh, the benefits for our patients is just undeniable. That's been hugely successful, and we've kind of uh, changed the, uh, the best practice about when we start that. Uh, so this has been a real success. We're seeing more people go on that, and uh, it's been really instrumental. It's making a difference um, in the overall care people receive. So 
So just a quick question. Um, did you did you say that was there a cost associated with the switch and, and Yes. So um, we had previously been using maybe a dozen CPAP masks, um, a dozen to twenty we'll say, per year. Um, and these were very affordable, about sixty dollars per mask. Um, we've changed that to an almost $90 per mask, and we've already used more of those in the last two months than we did CPAP the entire previous year. And now these are all captured in the ALS billing, uh, the way that ambulance billing is done, uh, you're all familiar with. So um, this qualifies as uh, an ALS 1 uh, just by virtue of doing this. Um, you know, we don't do this for the economics of it. It's right. the right therapy to do. Yeah. And, um, you know, some calls uh, we'll lose money on, other calls we'll not. Um, but it's just the right thing to do. So it co does cost us a little more, but uh, what a benefit. Um, it's been outstanding. Uh, we did do a uh, revision uh, to the overtime um, and the way that overtime was calculated. Um, this kind of made its way uh, around the town administration in Deerfield um, just to take a look back at how we've been calculating it according to the provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And <coughs> that's been adjusted. Uh, uh, each employee um, received payback for uh, a couple of years, uh, very small dollar amounts, uh, you know, in most cases. Tim, what was your look back payment? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know, it was le out all the years was less than $150. Yeah, so I mean, the, you know, it didn't come out to a ton of money, but it's the right thing to do. We want to make sure that people are getting paid for what they're working and what they're supposed to get paid. So uh, that process uh, has been improved. We've changed our charting system. Um, just last week we went live. Uh, so there are electronic patient care reports that we are required to use by the state and there are various vendors um, that offer their products. Um, South County EMS for years has been using a product known as Image Trend and it's a industry standard. It's what is used by um, uh, by Massachusetts DPH for a uh, collection of their matrix data set. Um, it's a good product and it was an affordable product. The problem with it is we encounter some billing problems um, and it's not good with um, looking up data. So getting numbers and giving you data is difficult at best using the system we've been using. On top of that, it's a really anachronistic system. It was probably peak technology 15 years ago, but it just hasn't kept up. So we have transitioned to a different product, which is um, by anyone's account, an industry standard equally. It allows for more streamlined billing with our billing agency, Comstar. They get those reports more efficiently. Uh, the data sets for searching are just exquisite, um, if I do say so. And um, the ease of use, uh, just the, uh, the operating system, the way that it works for our employees is beneficial. Um, you know, we ran into problems with calls getting locked onto specific di devices which were licensed for the old product. This is all web-based. You can use it anywhere. It's been fantastic. Um, it's also um, in process of integrating the CAD system um, out of Shelburne Control with it. Um, everything about this is thoroughly superior. So we're really happy about this switch um, and it's been going well. So when you integrate from Shelburne Control, all of their data will feed into this. You yes. won't have to call, you won't have to track it down. It all just updates every several seconds. Um, so almost real time. Will you also be able to capture calls where we're requested and then not able to respond for any reason? Um, so if Shelburne Control enters it into the CAD, it will populate as um, a case in ESO. Okay. Correct. So it's very robust um, mm -hmm. in every single way. It's a real improvement. And uh, individually, I'd be very happy to go over and show you just what I'm talking about in person um, or any of our folks. <coughs> Is there a question? Is there any 
do you have any connection with the hospital with this as well? I mean, is it easier to transition information to the hospital through this program? The way that that works, it is actually, there's another product which um, we're pursuing. Uh, <coughs> this is on the hospitals end, and so far it looks good. Um, this program has a healthcare data exchange which allows um, exchange of inter information between the hospitals. So not only is this uh, an outstanding billing resource for us, um, but it means that our providers actually get feedback on the calls that they do um, from the hospital and uh, it ties their medical record to the chart. Um, it really is amazing, but that component of it is not enabled yet. Um, that is up to the Bay State Health System um, to move forward with or not, uh, because it relies on them sharing their data, right. right? So that may not happen. I'm hopeful that it will. I know that there is some momentum, at least with the um, EMS medical directors at Bay State to move forward with that. Um, I don't know anything beyond that. So. And I, I don't think, like, Cooley Dick can't share with Bay State right now either, can they? Correct. They're on different uh, charting systems. Yes. Um, so this product could also work with Cooley Dickinson um, should they choose to do it. Um, but it'd be something that they would have to pay for. And there's yep. not a ton of services in Franklin County using the system. So, um, you know, in other parts of the country, it's the only thing used. Um, but uh, it's a great product and we're really thrilled. Imagine um, getting feedback on your calls. What a novel concept. Yeah, it's okay. not actually. Um, I've worked for systems where we have direct remote access to the hospital medical records at the point of contact, um, and it's amazing. Uh, it's not quite that robust yet in this area, but maybe we can get there eventually. It'd be great if we could. Baby steps. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, entered into um, a billing arrangement. We've set up uh, an account with some different supply vendors, and we've now kind of started looking at equipment differently. Um, over the past several years, we've been ordering from uh, one primary supply vendor for our consumables. And their prices are pretty good, but we found other vendors that have better prices. So now, instead of just simply ordering based on the convenience of going from one website, we're comparing prices on equipment between separate vendors and we're ordering on what's cheapest that day. Um, so this can vary day to day. Um, so that's just a practice that we've taken on just to try and pinch pennies. Um, it's the same equipment, uh, whatever supplier we get it from, manufacturers are identical. But we're really trying to make a big effort. Now, you'll notice that the, uh, the budget that recently passed our medical supply budget increased substantially um, from previous years, and that was on purpose because of things like the addition of BiPAP. Um, we're going to be putting uh, the surgical airway kits. Um, you know, I'm hoping to uh, deploy um, ultrasound and video laryngoscopy within the next year to two years, so we're going to have to pay for those consumables somehow. So the money is there. Um, and we do recapture that as part of our billing, so uh, that's really fantastic. We changed our phone vendor. Uh, goodbye TPX and hello Comcast. Uh, this was a remarkable savings of several thousands of dollars. Um, and this went into effect last week also, right before the end of the fiscal year. Our phone numbers have not changed, um, so if you call the office, you still call the office. Um, there are a couple changes when we call now instead of uh, it popping up as Deerfield Rescue, and we'll say South County EMS. Um, some of the extensions within the building have changed, um, but the primary numbers, our main number and our fax number and my direct line have not changed. Uh, so business as usual there, we're just saving money for an identical service. Uh, this also ties in because there are internet service providers, so now it's all under one bill. I also changed our internet service uh, from 
you know, get service to, um, you know, 500 by 35 business, um, which is completely adequate. Um, if we were, you know, farming Bitcoin or something, I'd say we shouldn't have changed, but this was the right move. So it saves us a substantial amount of money. So that's really exciting. Uh, digital pagers, uh, this was uh, a long-standing project where the analog pagers were going to be replaced. This was all uh, through FERCOC and uh, those digital uh, pagers are now deployed. Our crews are wearing them now and as far as I understand there have been no issues with them. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, we did purchase uh, wireless collar mics. Uh, this was a safety thing for me. Um, the crews, uh, of course, wear portable radios uh, for two-way communications with various agencies and children control um, when they're out and about. Um, but we haven't had collar mics for them. And this is just a safety thing. There's a big difference reaching down, grabbing a radio, and talking to it versus, okay, right. Um, the cost was a marginal difference, so we went with wireless ones, so they're more convenient for people. There's charging stations in that system. Uh, Zach Battistoni set all that up for us, and it has been operating flawlessly. Uh, those are paid for, um, and this, this has been a good thing. Um, and then we're making major changes to our hiring and onboarding processes. Uh, so this is something that we'll go over a little bit uh, later in the agenda. Um, we are, um, I posted uh, that we're hiring for additional per diem employees. Um, we did first round interviews a few weeks ago. Um, about half of them made it through that and are invited back to a second interview, um, which is occurring tomorrow actually. Um, so we've changed the hiring process dramatically. Um, so all of the town requirements, uh, all of that has not changed. Of course, we don't touch that. Um, but the way that we approach the interview is we had employees come in and sit in front of a panel of peers. Uh, so there were four um, employees, including a per diem employee, just to represent um, that component. Um, and they interviewed with the peer panel. Um, and then they came in and interviewed with me. And we had a very similar question set, uh, but different question set. Uh, there was some overlap. Those that made it through coming back tomorrow will meet with uh, Dr. Matt Shapiro uh, in the morning, uh, who is our medical director. He's not an employee of South County or um, uh, any of the towns. Um, he is a emergency medical physician with uh, Bay State Franklin. Um, but he is responsible for medical control of our organization. So I really think it's important to capture uh, Dr. Shapiro's input throughout the hiring process um, because that's going to bring things to light that maybe I don't consider. They'll then meet with me again. I will make provisional offers and uh, confer with all of you after that. Um, and then we're adding a background check um, that is substantial and we'll go over that later on. Um, if somebody makes it through all of those steps, then we'll follow the usual process of, you know, see if you nod your heads, they go to uh, Town of Deerfield Select Board and uh, personnel and all of that. So, um, not really changing any of the, the legal process, just our approach to who are we going to let with this unit. Um, for short-term goals in fiscal year 25, uh, we have taken delivery of our non-transport vehicle that was uh, appropriated uh, through capital. Um, it's right outside and I'm happy to show it to you. It's a 2024 um, Ford Mach-E. It's absolutely wonderful to drive. Um, that is not ready to go into service until uh, warning devices have been added, until it's been lettered and branded and upfit and all of that. I expect that to happen and be completed over the next few months. So my goal is, and this is part of hiring additional per diems, is to more regularly be able to put a paramedic or two on that car because that allows us to capture intercept work outside of our response area 
while maintaining our coverage within it. So that means if somebody in our three towns calls 911, they're going to get one of our ambulances. But if somebody outside of our towns needs a paramedic, they can get it. Uh, and the cost is incredibly low, and that's all billable. Is that going to be staffed with people that are going to be here or people that are going to be on call to respond? No, they wouldn't be here. So they yeah. you would actually have So them here. we don't have any model which allows for on call employees at okay. this point. I, yeah. it, just a question. That's yeah, good. sure. Um, so I'm really hopeful about that. So far, everything is moving along really nicely. So that's happening, and check it out before you go home tonight. It's really cool. Um, the Climb event has been installed, um, so this was a um, wonderful gift from the City of Greenfield Fire Department um, who had installed this in a temporary station. Um, it was going to be torn down and disposed of and they offered <coughs> it to us. So we have paid for the removal of it from their temporary station and the installation here. Um, we paid for half of that, um, totaling around $5,000. Um, the other half was paid by Deerfield um, um, as part of buildings. So we're very thrilled about that. It's not hooked up yet. Um, we have three outstanding, uh, so it's installed, but there's no electricity to it. So we have three electrical projects that need to happen. Um, we were waiting until July 1st for to move forward with these. One of them is hooking that up. The second one is the installation of the EV charger. So I've got an EV, but I don't have a way to charge it. Um, so we're not really doing much with it right now, except it does look pretty out there. Um, and then the third part is just a couple of- um, You could go to Town Hall. I was just to say, to right. um, Yeah. So- um, um, And we might even be able to- I'm sure we can. Give you a card that lets you charge for, you know, no charge or, you know, Basically, that's an option. Yeah, if it can be even built to our department, yeah, that's wonderful. Really. But I mean, just I, as, a, I, as a short term thing, I, I would say absolutely. Yeah. Who would I reach out to about that? Unfortunately, Chris Nolan just left, so I'd probably reach out to um, Casey and Christopher Dunn. Okay. Yeah. That was um, one thing when we got the new EV chargers. I said we need to be able to control the system at Town Hall instead of trying to call the charge point people and get mm -hmm. them to do stuff. So we do now have control of setting what the rate per kilowatt hour is, et cetera. That's great. So yeah, I'm happy to um, <coughs> pay for the electricity that we use. If it can be billed to us, if I don't have to pay, that's even better. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. But somebody's paying for it. So um, the reason we went with an EV, um, because this came up in town meeting, uh, there was some uh, some people were questioning whether this was the right move. And if it were an ambulance, I would agree with that. Um, that technology for ambulances and patient transport just does not exist yet. It's not there. But for intercept work, this is a perfect vehicle for us. You know, the police don't typically like using all electric vehicles. They like the hybrids, and that makes sense, right? Because they are out in their cars all day. But that's not how we operate. We go do a call we return to the station. Maybe we do a couple or a few calls, we return to the station, we can charge it. So, you know, for us, the charge of, uh, the cost of uh, charging that vehicle versus the cost of a tank of gas, it's not even close. We save so much money. On top of that, if I were to go buy a Tahoe and upfit it, I'm looking at 80 to 100 grand, depending on what we do for it. This thing's gonna cost us less than 60 complete. So it's just a remarkable savings. And its entire purpose is to deliver ALS care to a scene. That's it. It's not meant to transport it. So it's a perfect vehicle for us. So I'm hopeful that it'll uh, be good. Um, and then the other electrical project um, is we need some uh, wiring installed in the station prior to the um, station alerting system, uh, which is kind of on hold right now because of the, uh, the vendor. Um, but I'm not really in a hurry. That's fine. We, we have plenty of time to do this, and we have plenty of other things going on. That's going to put all of us uh, in a really good position um, to be ready to respond 
uh, for whatever really strengthens our department. Um, let's see. Um, we also will be ordering a new stretcher to replace our oldest model uh, very shortly. Um, we're going to be ordering a new stair chair. Um, Grant Queen uh, Lori McComb um, recently submitted and we were uh, awarded a CSX grant um, which will pay for a new stair chair. So that's really fantastic. Um, so thank you Lori for your hard work on that. I talked about hiring additional per diem employees um, and then short term goals. Last one is we have the uh, Medicare ground ambulance survey. Um, which is due um, over the next several months. So that's a project that I'm going to be working on a lot. Um, and it's very similar in the, the data set that they want reported on to the CPE. Um, but it's a, li a bit more in-depth and it's formatted differently. Uh, but this is the, the ground ambulance survey is an undertaking that uh, the Centers for uh, Medicare is taking on nationwide. Every ambulance provider has to do this period, and they've been doing it over a three-year period um, to compile all this data uh, nationwide and do a report to uh, Congress. So uh, it's something we must participate in, um, and it's going to be time-consuming, so that's all I have to say, but uh, we're in a good position. Long-term goals for 2025, of course, we'll continue with the CPE. Uh, that was recently um, paid out. Um, Brenda hasn't seen it yet, um, but uh, we did receive notification that that was awarded, so that's great. Lori, what was the final number on that? 70? 70, 70,900. It was a few thousand more than we were anticipating. So that's outstanding. So, uh, you know, the CPE program, if you're not familiar with it, this is uh, basically a Medicaid gap payment. So um, we're really lucky that uh, the Commonwealth of Mass um, has this project. What happens is we bill out a call and Medicaid, I will say, our Mass Health in Massachusetts doesn't pay a lot. Um, in fact, sometimes it doesn't come close to covering the cost of the call. But I will say they are very good about paying. Uh, they're consistent, they don't deny things, um, and they're fair. So what this program attempts to do is look at how much money we weren't paid out from that and cover some of that gap. Um, so that's what we received for last year was the 70,000. We'll be doing that again next year. We can do that every year and we'll move it forward. Was the work on that, who put the work in to make sure we got that? That was prior to my starting here. So I know that Lori had a big part to do with it. So thank you again, so Lori. Thank you again for the work um, to get that done. Lori, sorry, it. I'm taking it over this year, um, but, um, you know, we can still be friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah, revoked. So, um, another long-term goal is um, I will submit for a community EMS authorization. Um, I don't have um, any huge goals with this authorization. Um, we could talk about this maybe in another meeting someday. Um, but really, this is to lay the groundwork for future endeavors. Yeah. So just to pop back to CP for just a second, um, was this something you had sort of anticipated getting, but you didn't know? So with this, no, we knew it would happen. No, I meant the the, the number. It's <clears throat> uh, within a couple thousand dollars. So you worked it into the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. That it was is. Awesome. Unfortunately, I wish I could say. No, no, no. Here's a, a chair. That would be a great surprise, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so community MS that'll be happening um, and starting small. Um, but that opens us up to different grant funding opportunities um, that we don't currently, uh, that we're not eligible for right now. Uh, plus, it allows us to do some really good work in our, our three communities, which is outstanding. So that's educational um, stuff. Can you explain? It could be educational. It could be safety uh, related. It could be car seats. It could be trip hazards. It could be window and fall prevention. Um, it could be... Um, mobile health screening, it could be vaccine clinics, it could be all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, uh, there is a defined list of things that can be done issued by DPH. Um, we won't do all of those things, it's not pragmatic, but we will cherry pick and um, we'll make sure that we're able to do that. I know that working with um, 
you know, Board of Health and, um, you know, the regional uh, public health nurse. Uh, we do have the vaccine storage refrigerator here. We've had some communication with each other about this and um, we're pretty enthusiastic that by flu season this year, um, we can be offering flu vaccines, which is pretty great. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It's just another way that we can, you know, help out the community in other ways. Um, it's wonderful. So, um, I really want to put ultrasound on the ambulances. Um, this is huge because, um, uh, you know, this is something I did at my previous uh, service, and it is. Working as a paramedic without it seems a little anachronistic at this point, um, and they don't know what they're missing yet, um, but in two years from now, they're gonna be like, how did I ever work without this? Um, it's a really valuable diagnostic tool. Um, so that's something I'm gonna look forward to over the fiscal year um, to do. Um, so that's you know something I'm eyeballing right now. Um, can you give an example of how this would be? So, yep, so beneficial? ultrasound, uh, yeah, sure. So what we typically use it for would be um, in our care setting as a multitude of uses. Uh, initially, the way I plan on rolling this out is for um, carotid pulse checks and apical coronary views um, in cardiac arrest. You can assess for pulseless electrical activity in traumatic arrest. Um, which is outstanding because without getting overly clinical, um, people who appear to be in cardiac arrest from traumatic injury may actually have cardiac output. You just can't feel it because of profound um, uh, shock. Um, so we can actually look inside and see, and that's really nice. You can assess for pneumothorax. You can look for free fluid or bleeding in the abdomen in cases of trauma. Um, so there's the opportunity to um, you know, miss under triaging people and actually uh, pick up on injury that we may otherwise miss and get them to the appropriate uh, trauma center. Um, they're wonderful for peripheral uh, IV cannulation. People who are really difficult to get IVs in, we'll just look at the vein and put the catheter in. Uh, it's, there's more to it than that. It's not quite that simple, but you know, to bear it down. So it has a lot of utility. Um, <laughs> we're not doing echocardiograms, no. we're not doing pregnancy exams, we're not scanning for DVTs, we're not, you know, there's a ton of stuff that it, the technology is used for that right. we wouldn't use it for, mm -hmm. but um, it has a lot of utility. So, what kind of cost are we looking at to get the units in here? So, there's a couple of major players. Um, the more affordable version is like the Butterfly IQ, which last I looked was about $2,500 per device, but then you're paying uh, an equivalent amount of money over a three-year subscription program. Um, the GE ViewScan Air uh, is what I've deployed in the past, is $5,000 a piece, but there's no subscription plan. So the cost equates no matter yeah. what you do. We'll need two of them. Mm -hmm. um, at minimum, I'd like to get three because it'd be good to put one on the non-transport. Um, they connect to the tablets that we already use for our charting and all of that, so okay. um, that saves a lot of money there versus a dedicated machine, mm -hmm. right? And they're absolutely wonderful. And then hopefully um, we can, within fiscal year 25, take delivery of the ambulance that we ordered. Um, I know that we're supposed to maybe have an engineering review of that. Uh, that vehicle in October or November uh, to finalize uh, how that's completed. And hopefully it won't take much longer than that to actually be delivered. So that will replace the existing A3, uh, the red rocket they like to call it. Um, and the current A2 will then become the spare vehicle. Um, I had sent out an email along those lines about we need to find a home for our spare ambulance. Um, it needs to be climate controlled and I need to be able to plug the truck into a shoreline. Um, I can redesignate it as a class two ambulance, which means that it doesn't need to be checked every single day, um, but needs to be kept in good order. It doesn't need to be constantly stocked with every <coughs> piece of equipment and medication and all of that. It's meant to be a reserve unit, but I still have to keep it indoors and charge it up for its useless to us. 
we have three garage bays I'm looking to designate this. Um, so I need to find a home. Did so you talk to Whaley? I haven't talked to anybody yet, but um, I will follow up on that. So I know that uh, Deerfield DPW might be an option. Whaley might be an option. Um, if anybody has any other ideas about where Tom we're going to you know about Sunderland. Yeah. Tom did, yeah. yeah. So we'll, Is uh, South Deerfield full? Well, we're full. No. I'm not sure. So I, I haven't they reached out. This is probably. like a brand new project. So, mm. um, so that's what I have for my report. Um, the other piece might be the old Sunderland Fire Station. That's now the Sunderland Water Department. It's, um, oh, what's the restaurant that's right there in front now? Okay. Blue Heron. Blue Heron. It's right behind the Blue Heron. It's right in the center of Sunderland. Yep. So that becomes a pain for our guys if they need to uh, swap trucks. That means yep. that they need to go grab it. Yes. Um, and that is a pain. Um, but it's also something that doesn't happen a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully once we have a new vehicle, we don't have any of us. Yeah. So we need to have a spare ambulance, all there is to it. But we just don't have enough base space in this building um, to accommodate all of our needs. So. Talk to Deerfield about putting an addition on. Well, we could talk about an addition. Yeah, you brought it up, not me. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, yes, isn't that in the uh, building fund? So, um, any other um, questions or comments about that report? No, I was when you showed the fiscal year end 24 response total of just shy of 1,500 calls. I'm sorry, I, I go back in history. We built this thing for a thousand. Right, we've had some changes along the way, but to see that we're doing 1,500 calls and 1,200 responses, and it's still performing well, it's yeah. exceeded my expectations anyhow. So it's Same here. <laughs> I, I feel very good about this. Um, I feel good about seeing the numbers and the fact of where the calls are broken out between Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley still kind of ties into the way the costs are still broken out. Right, right. Um, so those three years of uh, discussion and negotiations have all paid off. And then the, the other part that's I really take joy in is the way that the service has grown, the way that you're looking at <clears throat> how do we continue to improve this in the future, how do we continue to add additional services, how do we continue to provide better service for our residents to make sure they're well taken care of um, as opposed to being something that was created and just has become stagnant i just see it we just keep growing right. every year not only in call volume but in our abilities to provide that emergency care for our folks now with this increase to greenfield what you're saying um, have you had to call mutual aid in to cover our three towns? Almost no. non-existent. We actually did have one mutual aid call come into town today, um, but that was because we were doing our own call. Um, it's it does happen, um, but monthly it's only a couple of calls. Um, so that's why I really am eager to get something like this going where we can maintain. the The other thing I would really like to do is increase the. Um, staffing of Ambulance 2. Ambulance 2 was set up as a peak hour unit to cover certain times of day. The way that that has been realized is some days it's not up at all, some days there's one person, which means we don't have it, some days it's up for eight hours, and some days it's up for 16 hours. And there is a formula to it, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. That's not really acceptable. I think it's a very reasonable goal. We're covering three communities here. It's a very reasonable goal to have two ambulances staffed. So uh, that demand is there. So uh, I would like to slowly, very slowly, increase the number of operational hours that Ambulance 2 is up. Um, I want to one actually realize its uh, initial um, utility and get it consistently staffed during the daytime. That's my first step. Um, and we can do that. 
and I think I can mostly do that with the addition of uh, more per diem personnel. Um, that's the role anyway. Um, so little by little. Are you looking specifically as an emergency response vehicle? As an ambulance. Not as a transport. Transport ambulance. Okay. But what's your area of transport? Anybody who calls, but primarily within our three communities. Okay. That's what we run into is, um, of course, you know, anytime there's two calls, there are overlapping calls, but um, we run into this overlapping call issue um, where we just don't have enough coverage, um, and that's not acceptable. So, you know, I'm grateful that, you know, you have recognition of the other things that we're doing, um, but we don't want to forget about our core purpose, which is to provide EMS treatment and transport by ambulance to these three communities. So um, that really is a priority. Um, and we're in a very good position to do it. So what hours of day are you hoping to, when you get to the slow <coughs> transition, so that both are staffed? Is it from 8 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon? Or, I mean, or is it 24 hours a day? Well, 24 hours a day is a beautiful long-term goal, but it's not going to happen this year. It's probably not going to happen next year, but I would like to get that up 12 hours a day. Okay, I could. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. And what's the 12 hour period? 8 a to 8 p, noon to midnight? Debatable. Um, I would want it in the morning. Um, when we look at peak, it's very predictable around commute times and lunch time. So probably 7 to 7, 8 to 8, it's, it's irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. 6 to 6 if there are suckers for punishment. I like waking up early. So, um, what else about that? As far as um, revenues, I know Carolyn's not here. Um, how are we trending on revenues and budget as we? <coughs> Excuse me. Carolyn is not here, and these are preliminary. These don't include the most current warrant. Um, those numbers haven't been added to this, but um, essentially this gives us an ending balance um, at year end of $304,663.43. Um, um, that's going to drop by probably 18000 after this one cycle because we are no, not 18 now because we're going to five off. That's going to drop by. Um, some thousands of dollars, um, but not a ton. So we'll finish around the $300,000 mark um, a year. And that, of course, goes forward to uh, retained earnings. So what have you done? How does that compare to year over year? Or have you done that yet? I haven't done that yet, um, but it's right along with what we budgeted. So that worked out really nice. Okay. I, I guess where I'm going is I'm hoping or hopeful that the enhanced services that we're providing and the additional calls will generate that additional revenue to help us. That is the goal. Offset the additional staffing. That, that is precisely the goal. Okay. You know, we're not looking to make money for the sake of making money, right? right? And that's the beauty of right. running a service like that. So, like this. So, if we can capture more money, that just allows us to expand service. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what I intend to do with it. Um, as far as, um, and we, this is missing June, um, but medical service fees were um, just over $800,000 this year. That's missing um, a substantial amount from June, which is a busy month. Um, so we're looking good. So financially, we're in a good place moving forward. Uh, making more money than the department ever has, spending more money than the department mm -hmm. ever has, and also providing a lot more service. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's what everything we should be doing. So no, that's good. I just and I'm going to defer any other uh, financial discussion um, yeah. until you know, uh, Carolyn or you know, yeah. the fiscal agent is here. The fiscal agent can talk about that. So. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, motion up D. Is next on the agenda. Okay. So promotion update. Um, I have 
Uh, we have two positions approved. Um, I'm working with Casey um, and we've created a draft job description for uh, an EMS lieutenant. We built into the budget two positions um, and there's a promotional process um, that is in your packet. There's a policy. Um, it's a draft policy that uh, I would like your way in and ultimately approval on um, by vote. Um, to include this to our standard operating procedures. Um, what this follows, so I'll give you a few minutes to read over that. I'll also put it up on the screen. Um, <clears throat> when do you need this approved by? Because I think there's a lot of information to take in. It sure is. So and um, I think it should be, give us a chance to read it. A hundred percent. I just want to go over it with you very yeah. quickly, though, um, so that I can answer any questions you have. The general provisions, uh, so this is A20 uh, promotion policy. Again, this is a draft. Um, the general provision is that um, testing, uh, it's a three-part process, um, and it follows a very standard public safety model. So there's a uh, description of what our department structure is, the EMT and paramedic, a lieutenant. I've included a captain. I don't have any intention on creating captain positions or hiring people for that, but I wanted to include it for future use. You never know. Um, and then the deputy chief of department currently uh, unfilled and myself. This policy only covers lieutenant and captain promotions. Um, does not include me, obviously, and it does not include a deputy chief position. A deputy chief position, if we choose that we want to fill that spot in the future, we'll need to create our own language uh, and policy about that um, and talk about uh, issuing a letter of authority for certain um, characteristics of the job beyond uh, class comp. So, um, this talks about that. A20.2 is I'd really like to only promote full-time employees on the off chance that we really need to fill a spot and there is nobody in-house who meets the qualifications. I'd like to reserve that right to look outside, but I don't see it as happening. But I think it's important to at least have some language about it. Eligibility point three is if you are a full-time employee, you are eligible for promotion. Um, you know, depending on what the specific spot may be, uh, the level of certification, EMT or paramedic, may be relevant. As it stands right now, all of our full-time employees are paramedics, so the point is moot. Um, but who knows, in 10 years, maybe we'll have BLS ambulances and it's not unreasonable to put up a BLS supervisor. Maybe we'll have a full-time community EMS person and it's not unreasonable to have a supervisor in that capacity. I just think it's, you know, uh, leaving it <coughs> open. Um, what we're after right now is to hire two lieutenants, right? I did not include length of service as a mandatory thing for promotion. It's very typical in this industry to see um, you're not eligible for promotion unless you've been employed on the department for five years is the most common. Three years is also pretty common. Um, I don't want to limit ourselves to that. I think regardless of how long somebody has been here, if that's the right person for the job, then that's the right person for the job. Everybody's so, going to have I just have one question about that. Yeah. So, again, and I agree, three years, five years might be excessive, but by having no length of time in the department, what stops somebody from getting hired today as somebody that you want into that job? And I'm not saying mm -hmm. you personally. What if I changed it to, um, you know, um, who is not in their probationary period? So that, you know, probably helps somewhat. Uh, I'm just, and again, it's not you personally, I would fear this. I'm just creating a policy or a, you know, a, a way to promote in the future. I, I would just kind of fear somebody 
saying, ah, oh, we got an opening, let's hire this person, mm -hmm. because this is who I want as my lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, sure, I see. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And typically, from the point somebody's hired until they're off probation is usually how long? I know it's going to be dependent on them getting skills done and everything, all the check-offs and sign-offs done. But. Yeah, so <coughs> that can vary, um, but Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, is it one year? Town is six months. Six months for the town? Yep. Right, so six-month probationary period. Um, so. But that's not realistic. Um, by the time somebody is actually signed off, it's probably longer than that. But no, I, yeah, that's great. This is why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Um, good catch. So, uh, 20.4 notice of exams, this is fairly standard. So once um, we decide that, okay, we're gonna promote somebody, um, I'm going to bring this to the town clerk who is gonna post it, um, giving a three month warning that this is when the promotional exam will be. Um, it gives people 30 days to apply for the position. If they don't apply within that 30 days, okay, you're not doing it. The test date will be three months out and will include who's eligible. So there'll be a list of all of the full-time employees that are eligible. Um, the subjects to be covered, the text that we're using as the source of the exam and the date of the exam. I spoke with the uh, town librarian in Waitley who has offered to um, proctor and host the exam. So that's good, it's a somewhat disinterested person uh, that keeps me sterile from the testing process, and that's really good. The process itself, the written testing, I contracted with a company in Florida um, to write the exam based on the materials that I have given them. Um, so the way that this works is they write the exam, once again keeping me sterile from the process. Um, it is proctored by a third party um, who then mails the exams back to Florida where they grade them. They then send us the results which get posted here. 75% um, unless uh, passing score, unless the uh, authors of the exam, the uh, third party testing company, say otherwise. Right? But that's where it'll be, 75%. Um, so, if you pass the test, you are then eligible to continue. If you do not pass the test, you are not eligible to continue, and that's that. Yes? Can the people taking the test contest it? So, in other words, if there's a question that's questionable, can they actually talk to somebody about that and maybe have it reviewed? Because I just somebody that's taken tests there have been questions that have been thrown out because they just weren't applicable or they weren't yep. they weren't even stated correctly so yeah, for sure so i can uh i can reach out to the test writers about yeah. that um I, I really feel that's something that i should remain isolated from right um oh absolutely but, but that's a great idea so i mean you could do it with this board as being somebody that could that could you know, as far as the connection with the test company or whatever you want to do, you can set up somebody I, separate local to yeah, do that. Yeah, I think so. I can facilitate that, um, but I think I'm not going to be the person to have the answer for that. Yeah. But yes, that's a great point. I will reach out to them. So if you take the test and you pass, yes, and you are not the top candidate, so right, you know, you didn't get hired into the position, since you've passed it, are you now eligible, remain eligible forever, or the next time a promotion comes up, you have to retest? I didn't include anything about that, um, but I have thought about it. And my, my thing was there should probably be an expiration on it. So I was thinking a year is probably reasonable. Um, how often are we honestly going to promote? Very infrequently. Right. Right, uh, this is a very small service with a very small staff. So yeah. promotional opportunities are gonna be limited. They don't exist at all right now. So yeah. this is really great. But um, I would think that probably there should be an expiration for uh, the validity of that result. And how often will you rewrite this test and send it back to this third party? So I don't, I don't rewrite it at all. Um, so 
I think it would be based on the source material. So if there were revisions to the source material applicable to the exam, then the test would have to be revisioned. So again, it's not a question, it's just a, a statement. Is that usually a three year time period for your exam is usually the way to go. The other part of it is, is that you have to get the test rewritten. It may be the same questions, but written in a different setting so that you don't have people that have the old exams yep. that can come in and have an advantage over taking the exam again. I was gonna suggest the three years seemed reasonable. It also might fit in with natu natural transition for the staff. Yep. Um, so if somebody who gets the job with a 95% and somebody who's got a 91%, um, the 95% leaves, this other person is eligible for you know a year and a half more but this, you're eligible just on a pass-fail basis, right? Eligible not, to continue right. the process, not, it, so not passing the exam doesn't mean you get a job. Right. It Correct. means that you've passed the exam and you can then continue down the right. process. Right, but you wouldn't, there's really no need to know anyone's score. It's pass-fail. Right, right. Yes. okay, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. So there's no... So right you would never, no. you would never know that you promoted somebody who got a 75 and somebody else who got a 95 didn't get the job? Um, I will see the scores yeah. um, and I will post the scores, um, but I haven't factored the score into this policy. I've made it as massive now. Because, yeah, right, yeah. Um, for sure. This yeah, so I, uh, I, and again, I think you might wanna check further on that because yeah. once you say it's pass fail mm -hmm. and then you post someone's score, you want to make sure you're not opening yourself up to anything. Any type of prejudice. Right. Legal question. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I because think if the poli that's no, it's a good concern. My thought is that if the policy makes it clear that it's pass fail, there's no ground for that. Right? Well, there's. But it could be an unbiased. There's always ground for. Yeah, it's a it's something that legal counsel could. There's, oh, yeah. there's also, Absolutely. so we could also go the other way about this and say that the score does matter, right? And say, okay, you passed with a 75 and you passed with a 95. So um, maybe that does factor into the overall. So, yeah. The majority of anything to do with civil service or anything like that exactly goes that way. So yeah. what you're doing is not yeah. following, in, following in the norm, whether it's, you know, right. so, fire or police nor or Nor are we civil servants, though. I get right. it. I get yeah. that part right. of it. But, but I think if you that. do pass fail, you cannot post that score. Because yeah, so that, that's just, that just and again, they, they're just they're small things. But right. no, I, I do think you want to check because sure. And and it looks like you have a, a subjective assessment part of this too that's yes. coming up. So right, because all that is doing is moving you on to right. the next step. Right. right. If it's pass fail, there's no need for right. anyone to see anyone's score. Other even their own. Other than pass, fail. Even right. their own. Right. That's mm -hmm. all they need to know, sure. is that they passed or failed. Yeah, yeah, but if somebody does a freedom of information request at some point sure. and finds out that, hey, I got a 98 and I didn't get the job, there's going to be an issue. Oh yeah, <laughs> so that's a good point. Right, and that's why you don't want right. to post them. Well, I'm not even talking about posting. Pass, fail. Yep. I know I aced this test and I didn't get the job. Well, I think posting it so, is important because it's one more thing that says, okay, this isn't favoritism. All of your scores are posted versus me coming to you yeah. and saying, hey, good job, and then me going to you and saying, good job, and I go to him and I'm like, oh. Well, no, I think you should yeah. post right. the pass fail. <coughs> I, I just struggle I think with you no offense. I think you need to look yeah. at the legal implications yes. of this. Yeah. You know, this is not yeah. a question that any, any of us so, right. yeah. We're not reinventing the wheel here. Yeah. There's plenty of uh, so, agencies that do this. Right. So, I wasn't you know. I wasn't even thinking about civil service that's your civil service or anything like that. I've just been going on the fact that this is a proven setup mm -hmm. as to the way they do business when you come, when it comes to public safety. Sure. And even people that are not civil service actually follow this these guidelines just to, just for you to look at and just see if sure. there's some way you can tweak it so that it it works for you and you don't get hung up on somebody filing a lawsuit or so we whatever could do, yeah definitely so we could do something where that score is included into an overall score 
mm -hmm. um, which makes a lot of sense. So yep. Yep. Um, let's just kind of keep it moving. Yep. Yep. Um, subjective assessment is I want to do an assessment center, which is um, I'm going to call some third party non or very disinterested people, right, in like capacity. So EMS lieutenants from maybe Worcester EMS or Fall River or Boston or from wherever, um, other municipal agencies or hospital-based agencies, right, nonprofit agencies, um, who work in a similar capacity, probably the medical director and probably a training coordinator who's not affiliated with our department. Um, they can put them through a series of scenario-based evolutions um, and they can rank in order of preference. Um, they then, after that, take their ranked people and bring them to me. I'm gonna take the top three ranked people. Now, we could combine that ranking with the written test score, which may alter the ranking. So that's food for thought, um, like an overall score, right? Or we could isolate them and say one, two, three, right? Um, but I take those top three people, and that's also a standard practice, is to take the top three, and then I interview them. My interview will be very typical. Um, it's going to be interviewing for that specific position. Everybody would receive the same <coughs> interview, and there would be a rubric for grading, which I would make available to uh, the person who's being interviewed. Um, at the end of it, uh, I did include some language here about promotional opportunities. So if there's one promotional opportunity, I'll take the top three candidates. If there's two promotional, uh, we'll take the top four candidates. We won't count them, so I mean, you know, how much do we need to go on, but um, there you go. Um, from there, I um, say, okay, well, this person is uh, the person or the persons that I would like to promote. And uh, from there, I let you know about that. I let the Deerfield Select Board know about it. They have their own process for um, approving that. This, of course, falls on the heels of the job description itself being approved by the Personnel Board, by the Select Board. Um, and so at that point, um, the Select Board would appoint them. Um, and we do, uh, much like when I was hired, we would do a swearing in and uh, registration with the town clerk and we're off to the races. I would ultimately like to host this exam. The test is written. Um, it's in the proofing stage. I have not seen it. Um, but that's the uh, communication I have from the testing company. Um, I would like to host this exam um, in October, and I would like this process to be complete so that by the beginning of the third quarter, we could um, actually have these people working in that capacity. That's going to involve a substantial amount of education and training and all of that, um, but I can worry about that. Um, that's all process that's internal. Um, so, you know, once again, the goal of this is it's one thing to have people take on responsibilities, it's another thing to actually have it part of their job description. So that job description is a work in progress. Um, after um, that is finalized and um, that has gone to personnel board and the select board uh, in Deerfield, I'll approach all of you with it. Um, and uh, you know, please take your time with this. I can also send you this policy electronically. Um, and if you want to mark it up, feel free to uh, give me your thoughts. Uh, I'll absolutely um, look into all of these points. Uh, great ideas. So, thank you. If I could ask, sometime over the next, when you have time, send this out to everybody, especially the folks who weren't here tonight. I know in the past, Tom has made a point where we're going to vote on policy. Oh, yeah. He wants to make sure we've all had time to read it, digest it, and then be prepared at the next meeting. So if it goes out to the to Tom and Fred, so if they can take a look at it with whatever notes you want to add about discussions we had tonight, um, so that we can come prepared to definitely discuss it in our next meeting. 
Right. So that's is, one final question for yes. you. Um, process question. That's the so, background policy. That's um, yeah. Does this is this something that that needs to go? Yeah. Oh. That's a different policy altogether. I was just going to ask. All of this is going to be reviewed by the personnel department. The uh, yes, I would bring this policy to the personnel board just to make sure it jibes um, uh, with the town. I want to bring it to the select board too, not for their approval, uh, but just for their oversight. Um, you know, it, does this conflict with? It's more appropriate for the. The person yeah, exactly. Board. Does it conflict with uh, bylaw? Does it work right. with the overall structure? Where do we fit people in in the class comp? Uh, currently, there's no room for uh, this position in the class comp. Right. Um, so that's something else that needs to go before personnel board. So all the provisions of this position need to go go up for that. But um, I wanted to offer this to you as a framework for the promotional process. Um, while all of that is happening, mm -hmm. knowing that these things take time. Right. Yeah. Well, it looks, looks good. I just wanted to jump in the process question whether we wanted to look at it ourselves before we send it to personnel or, Absolutely. or the other way around. You know, uh, and then, good, thanks. Yeah, of course. All right, uh, the next part of this is another policy, and this is for backgrounds and this has more to do with new per diem employees um, so no that's moving on can we move on to personnel new yeah. per diem employees i'm good yeah okay so um i'd like to change the hiring practice i've already talked about this a little bit where i want to be more rigorous in our selection um, we've never as far as i understand done any type of background uh, check beyond Inquiry. talking yeah beyond Corey and maybe talking with the police department, but that's really inadequate. I think if we're going to protect our organization and make sure that we're getting the, the folks in here that we want in here, we can do a lot more. So I offer you this as a draft. Uh, take a look. It is a ton of work, um, and we're happy to do it because I think the reward is worth it, and I think it mitigates all kinds of risk. So take a look at this one at your leisure. Uh, we obviously no decisions tonight on it, but um, this is comprehensive. So I have a question on this, just a general question. This is for employees moving forward. It will not be conducted on current employees? Correct. Current employees are here. Um, yeah. Anybody hired from this point forward um, if this is approved, would be... And it won't be repeated like on a seven year or, no. or any type of... Once because, you're in, you're in. All right. Okay. And this may be covered in here. This will cover both full-time and per diem or just full-time? Any other. Any other. Thank you. You want to wear this patch, you go through this process. So the idea here is that I would like to, and I would like to move on this one more quickly um, than the promotions. Um, I'm gonna be hiring a couple of people. We have second round interviews tomorrow. I would like to offer um, provisional offers of per diem employment by week's end. And at that point, I would like to begin a background process, um, recognizing that it <coughs> takes several weeks um, to conduct a thorough background. Now, that background check does not need to be completed by the time somebody has their first day and is brought on for onboarding. Um, it's still a provisional offer of employment pending the outcome of this, um, right? Um, so. And by the time we can get select board to appoint new hires, and I mean, we have time. So I would like to meet on this one fairly soon. So uh, please read through it. Uh, this is not fully my design. Um, <coughs> this is an established policy um, that I have amended uh, to suit our department. I removed a couple things for it, from it. I removed credit checks uh, as a verification. Uh, because I don't think that's reasonable. 
But at the same time, there's other things in here. Uh, I do want them to get a letter of good standing from the uh, Department of Revenue. Uh, all of the normal things that you would go for. Um, you said you removed credit check because in the first paragraph it says in a check of applicant's credit record. Yep, so I'll remove that. I must have missed that one. There was a whole paragraph I eliminated. So. Oh, okay. Right. So where is it in the first paragraph? First paragraph, third line from the bottom, A1, yeah. third from the bottom. A good note, the educational background verification. <laughs> that I agree with, definitely. Too many uh, deans have been found to not really mm -hmm. have their educational background. Yeah, it's important to vet people, right? Yeah. Um, can I um, motion to take a two minute recess here? Sure. 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 Motion to take a two minute recess. Second. All in favor. Yeah. Okay. Right. We're back in session. Back in session. Um, so that's all I have about that. Please re read through it at your convenience. Um, you know, send me your thoughts, um, and then we can discuss it hopefully at the next meeting. So um, who's going to perform this background check? <clears throat> ideally, um, what I would do is in the future, um, I would like to actually send somebody to training uh, to do background investigations. There is a process for that. In the meantime, my thought was to split it amongst two of our employees. Um, my thoughts were uh, Lori McComb and Zach Battistoni um, to conduct different aspects of the background. And then what they do is they work together to compile a report, which then comes to me. Um, there will be certain disqualifiers. So the idea here is it's not the crime, it's the cover-up, right? Um, what we're looking for is honesty and integrity. Um, we're looking for potential. Um, so I'm not looking to be a jerk and exclude people, because if you dig deep enough, you can find a reason to not hire anybody. But that's not the goal here. What, what we're going for is that if somebody did something that maybe is questionable, that they own it. Um, you know, this is, it's all about integrity. Who are we going to let wear this patch? Who are we going to let serve our community as an example of the best our community has to offer? the better I'd like to um, deadline date yeah. certain <laughs> tell me a date and we'll have it back because yeah you again I would ask send it out to everybody school student. Well, well write your yeah. term paper when you have to write your term paper send it out to everybody to review and send back feedback via email to you by yeah just July 10th sounds good is a week good enough it should be Now, once this is revised, it goes to personnel. Pers this, this doesn't have to go to personnel. Okay. It's an internal policy. Is that this, how you're looking this at This is it? internal. The only thing I would suggest, and, and I'm only suggesting it is, it's probably been vetted by lots of lawyers, but lawyers see things that we don't see, and it might be worth considering. I can run it by counsel. Yeah. That's going to be my question. Does it go to personnel and then counsel or counsel? Yeah. And if we don't have to do personnel because it's an internal policy, right. then right. legal still would be a good thing. So, uh, seven ten, we said. Okay. I will email all of that. I will email you both of the policies tonight, and um, you'll give me your feedback by next month's day. That's great. Excellent. Okay. Um, 
the intercept vehicle update, I think I've already kind of given you. Um, mm -hmm. We're working with a couple of local vendors to unfit this. It's going to be a few months. Um, but we've talked about its goals, its purpose. We still need to get the charger installed. Um, that's in process, too. Uh, that should happen soon, uh, hopefully by the end of this month, hopefully. Um, and that's a work in progress, but um, we're moving in a good direction with it. So just be aware that it's here, it's happening. Um, mm -hmm. That's all happening. Yes, yeah, very exciting. I, I just wondered, I'm the, the weak link here. I, I've never been on a truck before. What's a typical intercept time frame? So like somebody does a call out, meets the intercept, how long are they gone from the... It varies substantially. So it um, be so 30 minutes to <clears throat> 3 hours. You could be dispatched hours. along with the basic life support ambulance um, from the initial piece out. A basic life support ambulance could get there, realize that they need a paramedic, and start transporting, and you could meet them along the way somewhere. You might make it to the scene. You might make it to the scene, and there is no ambulance there. And now you've got a paramedic or two waiting on scene for an ambulance, but at least the person is getting care. Okay. Um, so it varies, and there are as many scenarios as there are calls. Mm -hmm. um, I will say it's a really unique and great way to work as a paramedic. Um, there's a lot of autonomy, mm -hmm. and, and it's just an exquisite position to be in, definitely. And if somebody goes out in the uh, intercept vehicle and they end up having to get on the BLS yep. and go somewhere else, the car stays there, somebody comes and picks it up, or how does that work? If there's two people on the intercept vehicle, one of them gets mm -hmm. in the back of the ambulance, the other one follows them, and it's a chase car. Um, <clears throat> if there's only one person in that vehicle to make the intercept, um, they're going to ditch the car at the scene, and they're going to have to be driven back. Okay. So you don't, you won't let another ambulance service drive that vehicle? I um, Potentially, but I'm not inclined to. The other problem is if we're meeting another ambulance, and they have two providers on that ambulance, say two EMTs, mm -hmm. I don't want our paramedic alone in the back of their ambulance. Right. Nor, if I were that service, would I want that to happen. We really need their personnel in the back of their truck, one of their personnel driving their ambulance. Right. So uh, really the goal is let's get a paramedic to this patient, however mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. So um, more often than not, I think there'll be two people on it, um, but there's always that potential of there just being one. I don't like the idea of ditching it on the side of the road either. But, um, yeah. No, I know. I just I know from past that, you know, I've driven those before when, you know, the Bronco they, at BHA. We all drove that thing. BHA would send a paramedic down. One of you know, they jump in our truck. We jump in the Bronco and follow them back. Or mm -hmm. if it had you know CPR was in progress, they'd leave it on the side of the road. There were times if we were like out here, police officers may grab the keys and might move it someplace safe and then we go back to the BD and pick them up. Afterwards. And that's totally okay. I mean, so. the other thing is that there's two paramedics in that vehicle, uh, depending on the situation, how busy the area is, they may want to separate so that the second medic is available to go to a separate call. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's all about spreading resources as far as we can get them. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just the amount of equipment and stuff in there. It's really not bad. Uh, because it's all basically going with the provider. Um, so, yeah. there'd be no drug box left in that vehicle? It'd be, with, it'd be with the call, right? So, it's really like a shell at that point. You know. yeah, I worry about just, it too, but I think it's also... I just also, think that the public doesn't know that there's not a drug box in there. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, <laughs> so you know, because you know, there's I, assholes out there. Well, I think we, you know, yeah, he forgets the recording. Right. So, um, I think we can be discreet about it. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not going to leave it on the side of the road on 91. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. I think. No, I'm just. You know, realistically, questions. it's going to have two people on it more often than not. That's really the goal. Right. And chief, even if it's a set setup where your second paramedic goes to another scene and then he's going to have to leave the vehicle because he gets on another ambulance, mm -hmm. you got 
fire departments, police departments, right. the state police. You've got a number of people yep. that will take that take that car right to the hospital, leave it off with you, and then go back and pick up their own vehicles. So I mean, yeah. that's been going on for years. Yeah. So I don't see that it's going to get left anywhere. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that's... I, I do get the concerns, and I have my own. Um, but again, this is not a novel approach to delivering uh, ALS care. I mean, this is how it started. So uh, we're just that's going, you know, we're just reverting um, a few decades. So. But that's where we're at. Yeah. Does the vehicle have, or is there a thought of putting in, and, and this is probably a double-edged sword, the cameras in the vehicle that look forward and look at the driver, and this way if somebody was to... Like dash cams, yeah. and all, we could look at it. I mean, it's not a bad uh, idea from a safety perspective or like a liability perspective, but um, it's, it's an expense. Well, the other thing you'd do is put a kill switch in it. The cruisers all have them in there so that you can't drive the cruisers away. So, I mean, and that's relatively inexpensive. Sure. Yeah. What is um, what is the key system of the car? Because, like, for me, this is my this is my key. So you can set it up like that. Um, I've elected not to, and there's a physical key. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have not enabled that. You put it in. And it's wireless, but you have to actually physically have a key or something. Yeah. So yeah, it's you can wireless. set it up like a Tesla, right, yeah. where your phone is your key. But we're, we're not going to go there. Yeah, I was just thinking about that could you know, be a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. paramedic leaves with the key to the car. And no, I mean like it. all staff have access with their with whatever piece right. of equipment they carry on their person that is Bluetooth enabled. Um, but I was just curious. Because yeah, every car is different. Yeah, and I was going to say, if there are two people on it, they should probably both have a key because. Yeah. Right. yeah. Not that anybody's ever gotten into an ambulance and taken the keys to the chase vehicle. So, um, there we go. Um, anything else about the intercept vehicle? It's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think this was a great. In idea you had it, you know, coming in here and just, you know, asking us for, hey, can we do this? But that's really great. I don't want to belabor the meeting any longer than we need to. Um, I will just say that I think if we want to maintain our responsibility to our service area, but we want to be a durable organization and fulfill the promise of actually being a regional advanced life support service, it's a <coughs> On the electric vehicle, there have been some reports in the news about flooding and the vehicles having trouble getting into deep water, shorting out battery systems. Do we know anything about? Um, I would hope that our providers are smart enough not to take any vehicle into a flood, okay. whether it's electric or fuel, uh, you know, internal combustion. Um, and I, I don't think somebody would yeah. joyride. I just get concerned about they're at a scene and you've got that almost overwhelming desire to make a difference, to save somebody, to help somebody. And, you know, sometimes people will take that urge and take a chance. So just, just well, a thought. Yeah. Um, um, you know, the heat of the moment thing, sure. Yeah. Um, Hopefully we have a mature enough crew. Okay. Uh, I trust the I people. Guess we weren't mature enough. No, our day, right? We were. Um, I can attest. We take that. we take somebody <laughs> else's vehicle to do it first. Uh, new business. I think we covered quite a bit tonight. Mm -hmm. We did. And in good time. In a reasonable amount yes. of time. Yes. Yep. I'd like to, um, can we set a date for the next meeting? I would love to. We can. Um, I'd like it to be sooner than later, uh, just so that um, we can meet to go over the background um, language um, and get that approved. So that I can, I think the personnel board is potentially meeting on, what do they meet, the third um, Wednesday? Is that what it is? I believe. I 
So yeah. I don't know if there is a personnel board meeting scheduled, um, but they would be meeting theoretically on the 17th. So if you have that back by the 10th, can we meet on the 16th? Quick meeting. July 16th. I'd like the 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If that works. Works for me. me. Works for me. Okay. I just put it in my calendar, so hopefully it's still a good date. Can you put that when you send the information out? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Any other business? Comments? Questions? Concerns? There being none, I'll entertain a motion. I'm to motion vote. Adjourn. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned at uh, 1932.